The migrants DeSantis flew to Martha's Vineyard have now been on more private planes than his entire family. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. The choice we've got a mandate, you get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend, right? Gina Grant. That's right. Handball, Brian. Guys, country music is amazing. <laughs> but, Dad, it's smoky. <laughs> I always suspected there were actors. Mm. I did. Uh, I did an infomercial. What? But pocket fisherman. It was one of my first paid comedic gigs. I was audience warm up oh. for an infomercial. Wow, that's oh, way more respectable those, than being in the infomercial. I was going to say those go on for like half an hour, right? The uh, I mean the final product. Yeah, the. Um, Bob Eubanks was the the host. What was he hawking? Game show host. Yeah, he yeah. Bob Eubanks, sort of the last real white guy on TV. You know, I mean, he was a white mm-hmm. guy. Bob Eubanks. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He just looked the part. Did he do the match game? No, he did um, Hollywood, not Hollywood not Squares. He did a bet your life. He did now. He did, yeah. He, no, he did a big one. Let's make a deal. But no, it was one of the ones were dating newlywed. game, the newlywed game. Yeah, the that's newlywed the game. that's the famous in the butt, Bob. Yeah, in the butt. Yeah, where, where's the most oh. uncomfortable place or crazy strangest place, you, place? Yeah, you've had sex, and she said in the butt, Bob. Yeah, <laughs> he was a delight. Went out to lunch with him. Wow. The infomercial was for this hand cream that repelled oils and and stains and odors. So for what purpose? So who'd be the most interested in this? Everybody. There were surgical gloves have been around for a long time, but nobody thought. Well, wouldn't a mechanic working at an oil change place like benefit from putting on the same gloves that the surgeon is putting on or the guy Mm -hmm. who's doing prep work in the kitchen or something like that? They never left the OR. Right. They just were there. God forbid you use these things at work for other applications. Yeah. Now it's it's commonplace to go behind the scenes at a mechanic shop or a a, a butcher or something like that. It's it's the guy's wearing the gloves, you know. They didn't. We weren't able to figure out how to get the gloves outside of the hospital, so we needed other means for transmission fluid not to stain your cuticles. Wow. And that was this magical hand cream that you'd mix up, and then, you know, you'd slice and dice an onion and then force the person to smell your hand, and they go, no onion odor whatsoever. I'm not uninterested in this product. I just want to know who, who I, it was for. I can't think of the name. It caused mass tumors. can't think of a <laughs> name of it. But uh, anyway, on, uh, on, on happier news, Chango, 92 years young, maybe the 93 Chango. years young, is going to join us that we discovered from Danger Island. We now. don't want any more guests under 90. Yes. The, the Danger Island was the interstitial with the banana splits and Jan Michael Vincent, one of his first roles, and directed by... Edgar uh, Wright? No. Or who did you say? I, mean, I don't know why that name popped in my head. It was a famous director. Sorry, which movie? No, no. no. The, the Interstitial or the... Uh, the Richard Donner. He did uh, Superman. We're talking Goonies about it. Sorry, I was glancing at Dominic Monaghan's I thing. looked to you, Brian. I know. I Sorry, I, I, for a second I looked at another bio. You. Um. So, um, and then the call, uh-oh, Chango would go out. How does it go? Uh-oh, Chango! And so the way it would work is... If we'll we'll play a little bit of uh oh Chango, the actual Chango was the most interesting, could be the most interesting man, certainly most interesting bio mm-hmm. I've ever read mm-hmm. in my life. But you just <laughs> yell uh oh Chango like the so candy man or something being, and they show up. They're being surrounded by paint painted faced natives mm-hmm. and they're probably gonna be on the menu tonight and all you do is scream uh oh Chango and, and he comes sliding in on a zip line. Got it. And he was a stunt man and he spoke gibberish in the in in Danger <laughs> Island. Right. Uh, but Dawson has his bio and his bio is insane. Now look when you get to ninety two you've usually done a couple of things in your life, but this guy started Early. He dropped out of school in third grade. 
And at nine, tried to stow away on a ship headed for San Francisco. He was found and sent back. In Hawaii. He was in Hawaii. I yeah, think, grew up in started. Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Witnessed Pearl Harbor at the age of 11. After that, tried again to stow away on another ship headed for San Francisco. This time he was successful. And then at age 13, he hitchhiked across the U.S. alone, sometimes stealing to eat. He began performing uh, as a knife and fire dancer in wow. a stage show. And served as a paratrooper in the uh, Korean conflict. Sure. Damn. He was captured, shot down by an enemy firing squad. Uh, he faked his death and was uh, left for dead in a mass grave. Jesus. He is permanently blind in his left eye from a hand grenade explosion. <laughs> He's got a silver star, two bronze stars, and two purple hearts. Wow. Then he survived a plane crash in Texas that killed 32 other people. That's right. Of course. And then he started working as an extra in film, became a stunt performer for better pay. At one point, he was the highest paid stunt, one of the highest paid stunt people in the business. And then he played Chongo on Dead in Danger Island. Yeah. That's when he walked into my life. Yeah. He actually slid into it on a rope. Swung in. I wonder yeah. what his parents' story is if he's stow- trying to stow away at nine years old and People. 11 years old didn't care about their kids nearly as much as, as precious, we right. do today. But did they notice he's on a steamboat headed for the mainland? He did stunts in Cool Hand Luke, Planet of the Apes, Shay, Patton, The Omega Man, Joe Kidd, Soylent Green, and the uh, Smoking the Bandit franchise. Oh, oh yeah. And because of his size, he could play women too, right? Yeah, he did Sally Fields That's and right. uh, Flying Nun. Sure. Because she had to fly, but yeah. Sally wasn't going to mm-hmm. do that. Right. So Chango was called. Um, so for me, uh oh, Chango is if you're standing in line at the cafeteria in the fifth grade and somebody dropped their tray of slop, you would then yell, uh oh, Chango, to alert all the other kids to make fun of the kid oh. that knocked the tray over. And it goes without saying they all understood what you were saying. Everyone understood, uh oh, Chango, so much so. That there's a song called Uh Oh Chango that was written. Uh, Lest you guys think that I'm just kind of pulling this stuff out of my ass. This was woven into the fabric of America. Oh, boy. Burns in some punk rockers' mind. Sort of lo-fi, K-rock vibe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know any more about this song, but I feel like we need to know. Who's that by? What was it? The Lizards. Okay. 1995, although I was told that, 96 in the other room. Out. Well, it charted in late 95, yeah. went on, you know, through the summer. Sure. Yeah. So I don't know who the lizards are, but uh, big Danger Island fans, wow. evidently. Obviously. You know, this is good because, you know, like you don't want your kid to swear and you don't want to, them to get in a habit. And you, like, We come up with like a crazy word instead of, you know, going, ah, fuck, in front of the kid. Mm-hmm. So I think if you spill something, we're, I'm going to introduce a uh, Chongo. Son yeah. of a Chongo. <laughs> My Mother guess is Chongo. the lizards had to have been foreign, Australian or British or something, mm. and this bizarre concoction only made it to their land many years later. Because mm. why would someone in the 90s, presumably in their 20s, in a band, give a shit? You even know who Jongo is. Mm. I learned of him yesterday. Why do you hate them so much? Who? The lizards no, of Jongo. No, I'm, I'm saying there's no way they could have had nostalgia as a 20-year-old for something that happened in 1969. Mm. Chungo also did work in TV, did uh, Mission Impossible. He did uh, The Six Million Dollar Man, one of the greatest parts of my childhood. Vegas, Magnum P.I., Charlie's Angels, Quincy, Fantasy Island. Oh, my God. The Brady Bunch. Jesus. What? Where? When? When they go to Hawaii? Oh, Ooh. obviously. I'd be curious. He was like a three-parter with the tiki and with the little did. totem. Oh, like MacArthur returning to the Philippines. That's right. <laughs> Chungo stows away, this time first class Pan Am. That's right. With Robert Reed by his side. That's right. Yeah, so he is, is he 92 or 93? Am I screwing that up? Chris will tell me. But uh, 92, it says 92 on the, uh, on, on the. 92, so we'll, right uh, we'll talk to him. Do you have any more on him, uh, Dawson? Sorry. No, that covered it. You got it from the, uh, uh, the TV was just the wrap of it. Yeah. Now he's in Florida. Doing a like stunt a, school yeah. in Florida. It, it also says that he has six black belts in karate, aikido, and jujitsu, and he Jeez. broke his bones more than 60 times That's doing what stunts. I was looking for. Yeah. Crazy. Insane. And still here, everyone. And... 
complete bygone era, the stowing away on ships, the hitchhiking across America, the sort of walking onto film sets and finding work. That's all it's all done away with. Yep. Oh, you got to be in the union and there's yeah. no there's no more of this. No, no more by the seat of your pants. An uh, irreplaceable anything. part of the show, I'm guessing. Who, who else could you get to play Chongo? Yeah. You know, if he was like, I want more money. OK. <laughs> Otherwise, we have that, that character's gone. <laughs> Um, all right, uh, Gina, you got some homeless vid oh you wanted to share with us? I, well, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the face, the true face of homelessness. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I live in the Valley and I, and I know that up until very recently, our governor has said that it's, it's a woman with three kids and I'm looking for her. I look for her every day. I look high and low. I look on the off way ramps. I look everywhere and i haven't found the elusive mom with the three kids by the way as drew always points out we have plenty of places for that woman to go right if she exists on the street with her three kids she may she would be welcome into many shelters yes now she would be taken care of the only the only exception is the family that parks themselves by like the target with the sign and then the dad comes and picks them up that's a Mm -hmm. totally different horse of a different color but i go to this very lovely dog park every day uh because we're puppy sitting and everyone's super (laughs) cool only a story if you had no dog (laughs) Well, I'm glad you said that because it's awesome. You can go any hour of the day. We do something that I like to call doggy disco at the end of the day where everyone gets glow sticks. It's great. And take the kid. and uh, Great time. Upstanding community. Great dogs. But yesterday, trouble was afoot. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Chongo. Chongo. So everyone's playing with their dogs and having a gay old time. And then we just hear this fucking scream wild screaming next to the park so that was the first clip i i sent you ben um let's see if you can hear this guy the dogs are starting to get upset they're going crazy uh-huh. oh this he's just singing here singing. screaming singing so loud walking around and all the dogs are upset all the dogs have so left their post i'm like okay whatever Guys just walking around. There's two porta potties out there. Whatever. What? So, oh, God for second part of town is this? How dare you? Deep Valley. Okay. So, um, so whatever. Then he comes in and he takes a shine to my little pup. So oh, I'm just oh, I'm God. real close by. I'm sitting right there. And I thought, you know, he's a nonstop monologue. Let's just let's just get a get a clip for the show. So this is one of the many things he was saying. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, have you seen the Green Mile? He, uh, he's talking to the dogs. He's sitting alone yeah. on a bench. Talking to God knows who. I love that guy. He's so fucking funny, dude. He's like, you're being funny. This is Michael Clark Duncan impression. Is there a chance he's talking to someone no, with those earbuds? I'm, I'm the only one there. No, no, no. Because those are that's music. He's screaming along to it. He takes whatever's in his bottle and starts dumping it around the dogs. And I was like, hey, 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 hey. He's like, oh, no, it's salt water. It's great. You can freeze salt water and drink it. I'm like, I talked to Vinny about that. So apparently this is also just a wonderful place for people to come on up and go insane. Yeah, the, the thing is, is, Nobody wants to be the person that walks on the other side of the street. But on the other hand, with so many just nutty, volatile, who knows what could happen, people just wandering, circumnavigating the neighborhoods like, yeah, we're freaked out. There's been too many cases of them punching people or pushing them in front of trains or whatever it is. And that's the thing. I mean, it's like he's... You know how violence has this new umbrella that it means so many things, Mm -hmm. but so does harmless. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, he's harmless. I'm like, I don't know. He's kind of fucking with the dog I'm dog sitting. Mm -hmm. And he's He's, harmless until he's not. Right. Seems erratic. Which is going to take less than two seconds. Mm -hmm. Right. But he did get up in Riverdance, which was awesome. He was singing Mm -hmm. a song about Jesus. He was listening to Christian rock. He got up and started like hop dancing and river dancing. That was fucking awesome. And then I said, you know what? I don't want to chance this. And we left. Quit while you're ahead. That's right. So, you know, mom and three kids haven't seen her, seen more of this guy. Yeah, that's all there is. Who else would sleep on pavement? Mm. That's all. Mm. That's all all you need to know. The uh, and also everyone you know would have access to somebody's sofa if they weren't junkies and they hadn't worn out their welcome. Right. There's the, the the concept of you having your wits about you. 
and not being addicted and calling any family member or any friend and saying, hey, man, I'm, I'm out of money. Can I crash in your pool house or on a futon or an inflatable mattress in your garage? There's nobody who wouldn't get that invitation. Yes. And just to add a little sweetener on it, he w- he asked us, which was very nice. I mean, technically, he asked my dog, but I was standing there if he was allowed to smoke weed. <laughs> he pulls out a vape pen. What the dog said? <laughs> the dog was fucking down. He pulls out a vape pen, starts inhaling like a motherfucker and telling the two dogs that were sitting in front of him that he got a great deal on this. So... I understand self-medicating. I understand that people do it. But, like, somebody please help this person. Because this is, he doesn't belong in the dog park talking to dogs. Um, so, speaking of uh, homicidal maniacs, oh, yeah. I interviewed Detective Paul Holes on Take a Knee. <gasps> what? Yeah. I love Paul Holes. I knew you'd know. Do you know there's a whole... Oh. There's a whole hashtag campaign called Hot for Holes. Because <gasps> girls love Paul Holes. Who is this man? He... Explain. He's a cold case detective. He <laughs> easy got on the, the eyes. Easy on the eyes. He was one of the guys, or maybe the guy from the Golden State Killer, the guy who... Oh, like when the case re-entered the sort yeah. of... Like yeah, with Patton Oswalt's wife. And- yes, 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 yes. Yes, he was, <clears throat> he was that guy, but he works on uh, many cold cases. Just had a discussion with him about sort of the... Uh, serial killing and like where it where it was where it is you know what I mean like now it's kind of interesting I, I have a clip please it's very I mean the um, Golden State Killer this guy was ooh man I'll play a couple of clips who uh, who's the worst of the worst that maybe we've never heard of some of these guys have better publicists than others they get sort of sexy names and Night Stalker and Hillside Strangler and stuff like that. And you've heard of them, but in terms of body count damage, you know, it, it, it may, it may be, you know, in the middle somewhere, but then there's other guys. Like I was heard some guy out of Russia that killed, you know, I don't know, 80 people or, or something like that. Uh, and then there's the way they do it and, and who their, right. who their victims are and the age of their victims and things like that. But, who are who pops to mind as sort of the worst of the worst? You know it, that that's it, it, that's a such such a hard question for me to answer because because of all the various variables involved. You know when you talk about the sheer numbers of victims, somebody like a Sam Little who was praying. You know he's he's basically moving around the nation, going into the underbellies of various jurisdictions and and um, luring you know drug addicted sex workers in essence and and killing them and what years and, was he active geez he he was active i believe as early as in the 70s up into through the 90s and uh, you know it was literally going back and forth between florida california up into the you know northern part of the midwest um, and he's got over 90 plus victims. Really? Uh, that, uh, yeah. And, and I think, you know, 45 have been confirmed, you know, but he, he admitted to many more, uh, and the, the people that are involved with, with, uh, investigating him believe that, uh, he's, uh, being honest about, you know, the number of victims that he had. Yeah. Cause there's the guys you've heard of, but they got nine victims or 13 right. victims. And then there's a bunch of guys in the eighties. Right. On over a hundred with some people. Yeah, or they'll say like, "Well, he's admitting to twenty, so you can multiply that by however many." Yeah, then we Charles Manson, the scariest dude of the decade right. of the century, five five victims, sold right. the baby too. Right. We also then uh, start getting into uh, the Golden State Killer, and I didn't know he called his victims. I didn't know that because he did a lot of just raping. And but like fucking with them afterwards, you mean or like? No, well, just, maybe he'll tell us. <laughs> saying sorry. And oh my hopes, god! No, no, he's fucking with them. Yes, right. calling torturing. Them. I mean, but, but I mean before or after, like leading up to it, or like I after uh, sometimes during twenty four <laughs> well, years that... after. Jesus. When, when he was on the lamb. When when he would these women, the the life is finally on track, and they can put this behind them. Yes. Yes, oh my God. I'll play the, the second clip about uh, him ter- terrorizing people long after he he was a cop, the ex-cop, and he would 
break into people's houses and he would kill a lot of them, but some he would just rape, I think. There had to be a part of him that sort of knew this must be looming somewhere. But no, I, I guarantee he was following his case, you know, through the years in the newspapers. Um, in fact, after a DNA link to Southern California cases in 2001 was made, he called up a victim that he attacked in 1977, you know, the two days later after the Sacramento Bee published a newspaper article. So he was following the case. And I guarantee, you know, through online resources, he's following the case. I believe he was constantly looking over his shoulder. In fact, when he was under surveillance, he did, you know, what, what Ken Clark called a gypsy run, where he gets up, you know, onto the freeway in his car and is doing counter surveillance moves as he drives to the airport, pulls off to the side of the airport before he's committed to have to go to the terminal. And everybody who's following him from law enforcement in pursuit has to pass him by not to burn the, the surveillance. Right. And then he just flips around and drives back home. And they backed off surveillance thinking, oh no, we've been made, you know, um, and we don't know, did he hink up because he saw some strange car or some strange, you know, undercover guy in the neighborhood? Uh, or is this something that he did routinely because he was so paranoid? It's possible both, you know, it's, it, you just don't know. He called the victim. What was, what motivated that? I mean, I know there was a story that motivated it, but what, what was he trying to get from that phone call? Well, this, this is what he was doing back in the 70s. We actually have a tape recording of him calling his very first victim up in Sacramento, you know, doing basically what it's, it almost sounds like, you know, the teenage boy, you know, heavy breathing. But then he starts in this tape recording. It's a, he, he raped her in, in June of 76. He calls her in January of 78, a year and a half later. But ultimately, is through clenched teeth, he's telling this woman, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Um, and this is what he was about. He was about, he, he's a psychological sadist. He loved inflicting fear. And so he was calling many of his victims back in the day. This particular case, 24 years after he attacked this woman, and now he's known the, the what he was known as East Area Rapist in Sacramento back in the 70s. Well, once DNA, and I was the one that did this, linked him to the original Night Stalker homicides in Southern California. And the Sacramento Bee put a newspaper article out there. He called this woman 24 years later to let her know he was still around. And when he called her, what he said to her, all he said was, Remember when we played? Oh. Of course, she freaked out. But that's what he got off on. This is part of his fantasy. He loved that psychological terror. Well, there Jesus. you go, Gina. I would, the second I got that call, I would go, okay, hang up, change my name, get a new identity, and fucking move. Mm. I mean, if he knows your phone number, assuming he's calling a home phone, then you're a sitting duck and you have to leave your life behind. That's oh. horrifying. Oh, God. I always feel bad for the husband, too. <laughs> we got to move. This Monday Night Again? Football's tonight. <laughs> nope. We've been made. <laughs> Uh, I'll uh, I'll get a deadbolt for the front door. You do understand that this person raped and tried to kill me two decades ago, yes? Uh, two decades ago. But you he said still it has your, our phone number. You said it yourself. I've seen composites of the guy. He's not bad looking. <laughs> Mommy, Daddy, who is on the phone? Get your suitcase. Uh, your uncle, Stu. Well, Anything you can pack, put in there. I want to borrow more money. Oh, our uncle's uh, coming over. Uh, I got to pack something? I know you're in your pajamas, anywhere. but get your boots. I'm put them on. tired. Yeah. You can sleep in can the I car. sleep with the window open? We'll sleep all it's night long in, in the car. Uh, no! Son, you're taking statistics at school, right? Yeah, very yeah, advanced. Yeah, the enough. chances of uh, the same unicorn okay. uh, being raped. Uh, <laughs> shit. Being Ra mounted Ra twice by the same. Oh, shit. Help me out here. You're going to get raped. Get in the car. <laughs> Wait, I'm so, this must be a dream. <laughs> Oh God! Fuck. Twenty-four years. Twenty-four years later, your phone rings. Nope. 
Not interested in that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> At some point, I, I mean, I, I could only imagine. A w- worst person on the planet. And then guys like Detec- Detective Paul. I mean, there's there's one of those. There's a yeah. hundred of those guys for every fucking nut job yeah. serial killer. True. And wasn't, you guys might have gotten into it, but wasn't he ultimately found out and essentially caught because like a distant cousin did a DNA test? I thought that was in my memory and many people's memory that somebody outed him like the Unabomber, like from a from a family member sort of outed him, but he, I thought that was how he did find the distant cousin in one of those 23 and me, whatever's, but it wasn't because the person came forward. Oh, it was just banked. It was just banked. They just Mm -hmm. look at all those databases and that's what, uh, that's what happened. All right. Kim Kahana. All right. 92 years young in from Florida. We're going to talk to him in a second. First, I'll tell you about concrete. Your body makes half the creatine it needs. The other half comes from your diet, but most American diets are low in creatine-rich foods. Concrete patented creatine HCL is the favorite creatine of elite, well-informed athletes. I take this stuff every day. Dr. Drew does as well. It's the number one bioavailable creatine. It's the only microdose in creatine. Just one small scoop. Per 100 pounds of your body weight, shake it up. It's got a nice lemony flavor to it. And uh, you immediately feel the energy kick in. Try it. You'll see what I'm talking about. Creatine is required for functional energy in every cell in your body. And your brain uses about 20% of the creatine in your body. So let's keep it going with concrete. Right, Dawson? Take control of your health, both body and mind. Build a better you with concrete. Register now at con-crete.com slash podcast. That's C-O-N-C-R-E-T dot com slash podcast for a chance to win a $500 Walmart Visa gift card. Available now online and in-store. Walmart concrete is truly life-changing and performance enhancing. Well, we'll take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk to the stunt performer and the veteran and chungo Kim Kahana right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Ace man, Ryan from Wisconsin. Tip for all the guys out there. When you go to the titty bar, keep your singles in a different pocket from the rest of your money. Gave a chick $100, and I didn't realize it until after she walked away. This was her fucking lucky night. Get it on. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Well, Kim Kahana, stuntman, actor, veteran, is uh, on Zoom, coming in from uh, Florida. Good to meet you, Mr. Kahana. Well, thank you. Um, so I was just reminiscing with uh, Sid Croft about Danger Island in the studio <laughs> a couple of days ago. And then I yelled, uh-oh, Chango. And then I started thinking about uh, you and Jan Michael Vincent back in the day and Danger Island. And then we started looking into your life and it turned out to be fascinating. Uh, so where did, how did the whole Danger Island thing come about for you? Uh, I was working on a set uh, with Gregory Pat and got an audition to go in and um, uh, do a backflip. They wanted a backflip on Chungo, and I had no idea what this was about. So I didn't go in because when you're working, you want that job. You don't want to go in for an interview. So I waited a couple of days, and uh, I had a friend of mine that was a stuntman too, and at lunchtime, he took me into the studio on a Barbera for the interview. And I went in and they gave me a script and I'm not good at reading and uh, reading scripts and things. So what I did was I, I jumped on his uh, desk and threw the script up in the air and did a backflip off and said, thank you and walked out. <laughs> And the next day, I got called and I got to part. Where, where did you film Danger Island? Mexico, uh, Acapulco, and Mexico City. And uh, Richard Donner was the, the director? 
Richard Donner was the director. I met him. He liked me. We got along fine. And he kind of let me have the reins to do anything I wanted on it. And uh, you worked, of course, with a young Jan Michael Vincent before he really turned into, he was a Hollywood leading man right. hunk a couple of years later, right? Yes, he was a very close friend. What kind of guy was he? Because I don't think any, I, I he don't know. He was a gullible guy. He lived in Malibu, had horses. He got married on the set. Um, he was just a gullible guy. The only thing is, he did a lot of drugs and drinking. On the set. It did. Uh, so you, you're born in Hawaii. You witnessed Pearl Harbor? Yes. Where were you when Pearl Harbor when the attack I hit. was in Pearl City. I lived in Pearl City, and I could see the whole dock. Wow. But I didn't know it was a bombing because it was in the morning, and us kids go to Catholicism and church. So when we heard all the noise and everything, we didn't know it was a bombing. We just went out, and then when you see fires and all of the shooting, then we knew something was going on. And so you stowed away on a ship and came to the mainland. Uh, where were your parents during this whole ordeal? Well, I never had a mother. I never knew my mother. I didn't know if I had any sisters or brothers. And my father was in the Coast Guard, and he was always out to sea or traveling. So I was raised by uh, Tita's, what we call uncle and auntie in Hawaii, we call them Tito's. And uh, that's how I grew up on my own, basically. And so you got to the mainland, to San Francisco, I guess, when you are 13? Yeah. And did you know anybody? Did you have a plan, a place, anything? No, I had a plan. I had, uh, my father had told me about an uncle of mine. He called him an uncle that lived in New York. And he played in a big, big band with Xavier Cougat. And so my plan was to get to the mainland and then to get to New York somehow and find him, which I did. Wow. <laughs> and so did you have any money or any provisions at all? No. Uh, I would go to farms and I would steal out of... Uh, uh, food bins. Uh, I would uh, knock on windows when I would see people eating in uh, restaurants, uh, work on farms, chopping wood, doing something just to just to get food. And how long did it take you to hitchhike to New York? I think it took me about four weeks. <laughs> I took trains. I rode trains. I learned how to catch trains with the bums and work with them and uh, live with them, basically. He's 13 at this point. Yeah. 13. Put in I mean, perspective. Are we talking about 1941, 42, somewhere around there? Somewhere around there, yeah. So you get to New York, and how do you run this uncle down? Uh, I, I tried to find out the big bands and the big names. And I got names of certain people and this. And so I would go to the stages and ask questions. And I had a little stage hand tell me about Koga and about the people in it. And I waited there all night until all the band people came out. And I saw this little guy that was Filipino. And I went over to him and asked him about things. And he told me, yes, he knew my father and stuff like that. And I stayed with him for, oh, probably about six months. And was there any, like when you got to New York, because it's a, it's a question that's ongoing now. Were there services? Were there places you could go? Were there soup kitchens? and Outreach. Uh, outreach. No, well, I never knew about homeless people. I never knew you could even do that. I would beg on the streets and, and get money, and, and people would help me. There have been a lot of people 
that would just come over and buy you something, a hamburger or something. And so then after six months of staying with the uncle, now you're the ripe old age of almost 14. <laughs> it's time to strike out on your own again? Or what was the plan? Well, he taught me how to play instruments, how to play the drum and guitar. And so I learned all that stuff. And uh, I would get into little bands here and there and just make some money. And then I went back. I took a train and went back to California because my father was in California at that time, not Hawaii. He was in uh, a different station in San Pedro. And so you reunite with your dad. Um, what's your dad think about your journey? He didn't think too much about it. We never got along. <laughs> he didn't notice. <laughs> So now you make it back to California now. We're still, World War II is still raging on at this point, right? Right. Um, and what's your plan from San Pedro? Well, I had no plan. I didn't know what to do. So my father put me into the Coast Guard. I was 16, I think. And how do you end up in Korea? Uh, after after the Coast Guard, I got out of the Coast Guard. Um, I was uh, 1949, and it's going into 50, and then 50, uh, Korea broke out. So I decided to go in the Army. So I enlisted in the Army and went to uh, boot camp at Fort Benning and learned how to be a paratrooper. And you end up in Korea, and then there's the part that seems insane, which is captured prisoner of war firing squad, mass grave. Paratrooping? Yeah. Well, no. We got captured. We were in a different balloon, and when we went behind enemy lines, a whole skirmish of us paratroopers, that was the 187th, and uh, got captured, and... Um, we were brought to a prison camp, and then uh, one morning we were brought out in a truck and uh, lined up. It was about, I don't know, maybe two, three hundred of us lined up, and they had bulldozers there, and they had dug a big hole and everything. And we didn't know what was going on, but what they were going to do is they were going to kill us and bury us, which they did. So how did that walk us through that? I find that to be interesting. I can't walk you through it. I, I kind of stayed there and I kind of watched the person that was shooting at me, watching their finger. And when I thought he pulled the trigger, I fell into the hole with the rest of the people. Oh, Jesus. God. And then did they bury you guys alive or are you alive they buried us then, and i didn't know where i was upside down inside out but i kept digging and digging and i kept the people that were laying on me to get air pockets and finally it felt like it felt like a hundred hours i finally got to the top and felt air and looked out and all these guys were drinking and laughing and giggling and I waited there until it got dark and crawled out into the trees and forest and made it back to my company. Oh my God. Did anyone else make it out of the mass grave? Not that I know to this day. Um, Yikes. Wow. So then now you got the silver star and two bronze stars and two purple hearts. I'm guessing that was one of the Purple Hearts, or was there something, there are two other no, things that, that happened? one of the Purple Hearts, and uh, the second thing came from a different, the Scar mission. A different, a different mission, did you say? Yes. So now, <laughs> um, <laughs> you get out of the Army, and you go back where? I went to, well, 
I was I was scarred up pretty bad. I got wounded pretty bad. I was blind. And they sent me to New York to get an operation. And I got an operation there. And I could see barely and went back to California to find out about where I was going to live, what I was going to do, if I was going to stay with my father and so forth. It, uh, jumping ahead, there's also a pretty insane story about a plane crash. That same when, when I when I took this plane from New York, it crashed in Kellyfield, Texas and broke apart. And I was sitting in the very back and the front people, there was about 32 people that got killed. I broke both arms. How many people were on the plane? Do you remember? I don't remember. I, uh, over a hundred people, I would imagine. And wow, and the 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 plane crash and the mass grave are not too many years apart. You had to feel either lucky or super unlucky. Final I'm trying to I'm trying to think. Did you ever? Yeah, I thought I was pretty lucky to get away from a lot of different things. So you make it back to L.A., and when does the showbiz and the stunt, stunt well, man I stuff get start? Back, I get back to California, and my father says I can stay with him, but I got to get a job and everything. And when I was younger, I was doing the Samoan knife dance, fire dance, because I grew up with Hawaiians and, and Samoan. So I went to uh, the Seven Seas, on Hollywood Boulevard, across the street from a Grumman's Chinese theater, and uh, asked if I could get a job. And there was a, a man called Freddie Latuli there, and he liked me and took me in and started teaching me more. So I worked there in the nighttime, and the waiters that worked there worked in the studios as extras and asked me if I wanted to be an extra. And I said, well, what do they do? And so they took me into the studio and I saw what an extra does. And they get like $8 and 50 cents a day. And then I saw cowboys on horses that were falling off the horses getting shot. And I thought, well, how much do they get? And they get $250. Mm. And I said, well, hell, I was in Korea getting no money. <laughs> so why don't I do that? So the only thing I had to do was find out how to ride a horse and get into the stunt business, which is not an easy thing to do. By the way, I do believe the seven C's turned into kind of a new wave or punk nightclub in like the eighties, oh. because there was a seven seas in Hollywood when I was like 19 and it, it was a hangout. Like people, it, I think it was still going strong into the, into the eighties probably this, took on a new motif. This is Chongo's table. They would yeah, say. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Right. So, uh, you start, you start getting into stunting. Did you, uh, come across uh, Hal Needham or... Uh... Well, no, I I didn't know what to do because you had to know how to ride a horse. <clears throat> so I wanted to find out who the top stuntmen were. Uh, and their names was the Eppers family, Johnny Eppers and his family, and Yakima Knut. They yeah. were the two <clears throat> top leading stunt guys in the stunt business. So I found out where they live, knocked on the door, and asked them to teach me. And Johnny Eppers said, fine, but you have to learn how to take care of the animals first. So I would go in in the mornings and clean up horse manure, feed the horses, and he would teach me how to ride horses and how to groom them, take care of them. This took months at a time. 
first movie I ever worked on, they took me into the movies. Yakima Canuck or Canup was a famous stunt guy. I know the name. Yeah, Yakima Canuck was one of the most famous, and Johnny Eppers and the Eppers family. Yakima. They were the top. Uh, so he lived in North Hollywood, California. <laughs> And he they lived, lived in Chatsworth, California. Oh, yeah. well, then they moved. Neighbors. They moved from Chatsworth to <laughs> North Hollywood at some point. He died in North Hollywood. Died in North Hollywood. Yeah. That's where he was. He 86. was on the corner by my house. He was a grandfather of one of the kids I knew. Oh. And it was like Yakima's house is there. And we didn't, you know, he. Yeah, Yakima was the only stuntman to get an Oscar for Ben Hur. Wow. He did this. Pioneered this move. I don't know what he called it, but he got on the front. He 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 jumped from horse to horse to horse and right. and go forward. Yeah. And a, when the wagon train got out, of I don't know. He had a. He was yeah. the only. He, st- made, he made a lot of stunt equipment for oh. the stunt men, and uh, we still use that equipment today. And it is interesting. There was and maybe still is a stunt school in Chatsworth, California, because I... No, that was mine. That was yours? Oh, my God. That was mine. I opened the first stunt school in the world, and the stunt people didn't like it. (laughs) Oh, so that was your place in uh, off of, I don't know, Owen's Mouth or something? Yeah, Heaven Shot. I lived on Owen's Mouth, and my school... You lived on Owen's Mouth. mouth. (laughs) I knew it. That's my school. Oh my God. That's so crazy. So I used to work at a cabinet <laughs> shop in Owen's Mouth. And then there's this, I don't think people realize that even through the 80s, there were big, vast, vacant lots and land, like mm-hmm. Chatsworth people had horses. It was, oh, it, yeah. it was well into the 80s yeah. that people had horses and land and stuff. And there was a stunt school. And I, my boss, um, my boss, Tommy, lived I, the, the the cabinet shop was off of Owen's Mouth mm-hmm. in deep Chatsworth. And I used to drive home and I'd look at the stunt school because they had a tower. Yeah. Guys yeah. had like a fall tower in the back. And I'd just kind of go, I wonder if I could do a stunt yeah. or something. I'm shocked you didn't pull in one day and see what's what. <laughs> well, I'm guessing they were charging and I didn't have That's any money. True. But Knocks on the door and Chongo opens the That door. was your stunt school on Owen's Mouth. Yeah. That, that was mine, yeah. Wow. That was one of the first ones ever opened. God. And I guess the stuntmen didn't like it because you were graduating a lot of people into their community? Well, no, they, they, the, the stunt business is handed down from father to son to daughter, and they have secrets that they don't want other people to teach. Mm. My idea was not to give the secrets, but to teach them safety and how you could be more safe, because we had no safety rule. Yeah, it was like, it, it's like magicians being like, I don't know about this magic class. Right. Were you... Uh, after a while, after about three years of working, the stunt community came back, and now, I mean, now we have stunt schools all over the world. Was, and a lot of them are scams. Were you, did you have a special gag that you were known for, like being lit on fire or f- high falls no, or I horses? Did, or? I, did, I did trucks for motorcycles. Oh, this is getting even better. <laughs> yeah, I did a lot of trucks for motorcycles. Rode barrels, jumped them. I did crazy things, which you wouldn't do today. So you were like in uh, in Omega Man. I think at some point yeah. he got on a motorcycle. Yes. I, uh, Heston did. It's on his uh, his CV here, Omega Man. Oh, yeah. He worked on the movie. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That's <laughs> all right. I'm good, but I'm not that good. <laughs> <laughs> but you, although there is the Owen's mouth. Uh, that was, that was nice. K- kismet. That was uh, good. So you did, you did motorcycles was kind of your specialty. Yeah, it was my specialty. But I learned from other stunt guys how to do fire gags, high falls. I was always a guy that did high diving. I did uh, for Elvis Presley, fun in Acapulco. I did the dive off of the cliff. 
That used to be a big deal. The cliff divers uh, of Acapulco. I mean, they yeah. wide world of sports would cover it. As they should. It's cool. I, 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 they, I would watch it. And it was always crazy because of how close it would come to the rocks. Yeah. And well, the water would come in and you would only have six feet to get into. <laughs> yeah, that seemed like the scary part. Uh, any good stories about, uh, I don't know, breaking bones or crashing motorcycles? Well, I, I have broken about 60 bones in my life. I mean. I broke my back twice, one on uh, Death Hunt with Charles Bronson. I used to double John Bronson for about 20 years, so I got hurt a couple times with him. And uh, my arms, uh, legs, collarbone, everything's been shattered somehow, <laughs> because, mainly because of me, huh. because I was too stubborn to listen. Yeah, so stunts have come a long way. They're a lot safer now, a lot more regulated. Well, believe it or not, we have more people, more young kids getting killed today than we did before. Really? Because the kids are only thinking about money today. They're not thinking about their job. But stunts in movies or stunts of guys trying to do crazy stuff on BMX no, bikes? stunts in movies. Really? Oh my God. Stunts and movies. We just had two guys, a woman, a girl, and a boy last year got killed. One on a high fall, one on a motorcycle. Oy. Wow. What is the craziest stunt you've seen? Like, they, first off, they had a movie called Stuntman, but they're doing, they did a movie called Hooper, and I think Jan Michael I Vincent. You had to work I at Hooper. <laughs> he did a fall off a helicopter ski into an airbag. I mean, what? I don't know. Yeah, I, they, you were there. I did. I did Hooper. Uh, but the scariest thing I ever did was going from one airplane to another airplane about 10,000 feet without no parachute. Wow. The James Bond movie? What movie was that? Airport, airport 75, I think. Airport 75? <clears throat> what kind of airplane? It was a DC. It was from a military helicopter to a DC. The idea was um, the pilot got sick and passed out, so they had to get a pilot to land the plane. So they transferred them from one airplane to the other airplane. Yeah, the airport series, which gave way to the airplane, airplane series. Yeah. There was a seventy-five, a seventy-six. 70. There was, there was one with the Concorde. Oh shit! Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what'd you do on Hooper? Hooper, we did car stunts. Or we did. Oh, we must have had uh, maybe two hundred brand new Trans Ams, and we. Crashed them like crazy. Everything was a big crash. Hooper is worth a watch because got yeah. Jan Michael Vincent's at the height of his powers. Burt Reynolds is as Burt Reynolds y as he's ever been. <laughs> the height of his Burt Reynolds ness. It's funny. There's a lot of laughs in it and crazy stuff. Stunts well, and analog stunts. Yeah, here on Wikipedia it says the film serves as a tribute to stunt men and stunt women in what was once uh, an unrecognized profession. So this is like a love letter to the stunt community. They right. they took down a whole old smokestack and timed it oh, so yeah. the car sped just underneath it as this giant brick smokestack was falling down. They jumped the car over a, a ravine like 300 feet with a jet with a rocket on it. Yeah. Hal Needham was in charge of that. Yeah, Hal Needham was the guy who, stunt guy who then kind of wrote those movies, but they weren't really scripted completely. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. a sketch. He was a friend of Bert's, and they lived together. And, and when you were doing stunts in those days and lived with the star and everything, you just became one of them. What do you think about Tom Cruise doing so many of his own stunts. I think he's a nutcase. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yes, go ahead, Brian. For you, Mr. Khanna, uh, alluded to it, but have you noticed, speaking of Tom Cruise and his crazy stunts, have you noticed a sort of swing back towards practical stunts from CGI? It feels to me like there's so much more now that's real on the screen. Oh, yeah. There's too many CGI stunts, and people don't know the difference. Right. You know, with the green screens and everything, uh, it's taken away from the stunt community. I'm going to take a, another deep dive. Maybe it's a Florida thing. Maybe it's just an era thing. Do you know uh, the detective J.J. Arms? <laughs> No. Oh, damn. Damn it. <laughs> We're on a roll there. He was a private detective who lost his hands and had different attachments on it. There was a whole action figure about it. Super 70s But a stuff. real guy. A real guy yeah. who's still alive, I think, and whose name is J.J. Arms, that even is. though he blew his, uh, blew his hands off. Um, the county wasn't J.J. Balls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what a crazy... <laughs> journey what a crazy story i'm looking you have a book out right kahana the untold stories uh yes there is a book out. Uh, and you can find it wherever you find uh, finer books um amazon, amazon <laughs> as well who uh list some of the notables you've worked with over your career oh god john wayne we could you could sit down with john wayne and have a beer um uh, Walt Disney oh my. would bring out lunch <laughs> to us. Uh, James Gardner. I mean, just tons and tons of good people. You can definitely stop after John Wayne and Walt Disney. Yeah, it's not going to get better right than that. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, well, Paul Newman. Paul Newman was a great uh, 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 guy. What'd you work on? <laughs> what'd you work with with uh, Newman? Uh, cool Hand Luke. You see him. You see me putting the egg in his mouth. Oh, oh my God. That's you. It's like the famous yeah. scene. Oh, my he God. Was, he was a great guy. He would make a bar in the, in his station wagon for the stunt guys. And after we would wrap, we would all have a couple of drinks. And, I mean, some of your stars were great, too. Like Burt Reynolds and those guys. They took good care of the stunt people. What a crazy life. I'm so glad we went down your rabbit hole because uh, a few days ago I was just talking about Uh Oh Chango and next thing you know, here we are. And, but, but between you and Sid Croft of Sid and Marty Croft combined, it's got a tough argument to figure out who's had a more complex, yeah. interesting life. I'll give the nod to you because you were so. buried alive in Korea. <laughs> <laughs> Tips him over the edge. <laughs> yeah, and the plane crash as well. Uh, Kim Kana, thank you so much for joining us. The school, Kahana Stunt and Film Schools in Florida. You can uh, visit their Facebook page to learn more. And uh, I'm glad to hear that after all these years, Chungo's still going strong. Well, they're still doing a documentary on me, and it probably won't be edited until next year on January or so. Come well, back, When please. it comes out, come back. I will watch the hell out of that. And just for anyone who can't see right now, you're you're sitting in an incredible room with, like, katana swords and badass stuff. So uh, that's amazing. Oh, it's like a museum here. <laughs> all pictures on the wall of all your stars and everything else I've done. Uh, Kim Connor, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Oh, man. Awesome. I, I got to tell you, between uh, him and Sid Croft. Um, Good Lord. You, Living legends. You, when, you, when you talk to someone in their 90s, you worry a little bit that uh, yeah, the some of the thoughts yeah. and the forms of the words and the things may not uh, come sailing out. He's a sharp 92-ish year I, old. I want you to just marinate on this because I don't think it's fair to put you on the spot. But who do you think had a more exciting life? Sid Croft, Kim Kahana, or Jim Carolla? Well, that's... You Think about it. Flip the coin. I'll be in the next room <laughs> awaiting the results. We all win either way. Yeah. It's crazy. And it's also... I don't think people like our children will be capable of having these kind of lives because 
the the way the world is is they'll go. I wanted to. I had an idea to open a stunt school in Chatsworth, and four years later, I got a permit. <laughs> <laughs> but. They still had to do a soils report, and then there's an environmental impact report. So everything's just been slowed down, and his, and their um their outlets were too high up on the wall. Yes, everything just takes so yeah. long that you can only squeeze in yeah. so much into a life. Yeah. Like if you're if you just go, I built a big custom castle in Malibu. Well, you could do that. In three years, or you could be doing it in 26 years now yeah. because of the, the Coastal Commission. Yeah, you know what right. I mean? So everything has been so fucking regulated that you couldn't just walk on to sets and you couldn't just do things. Ask for a job. I also think, I'm assuming, that the uh, the friendly hobo is a bygone era. Yeah, there the was train so hopping many, hobo. You're 100% right. There are so many elements of the story that were anachronistic, like, oh, this would never, couldn't, just show up in New York for, I think I have an uncle out there. But he did give me a lot of hope when I'm like, oh, I could never do that. Oh, it was easy. All I had to do was somehow cross the yeah. country with no money. Learn the guitar. Find <laughs> out this guy that my dad knew and uh, track him down. Yeah. Or all I had to do was go find the two families that teach the that do stunts and ask him to teach me. It's crazy that his stunt school was off of Owen's mouth and I used to look at it when I was 25. That was my school, he said. Dominic (laughs) Monaghan is going to join us. Another great rack on tour and we'll bring him in right after this. The Adam Carolla Show presents Dominic Monaghan's birthday cocktail party for December 8th. Let's see who's invited. Let's welcome Mary, Queen of Scots, the inventor of the cotton gin, Eli Whitney, the founder of General Motors, William Durant, David Carradine joined the party. From the Impressions, let's welcome Jerry Butler, the drummer for the Hollies, Bobby Elliott, Toots Hibbert is here from Toots and the Maytals, Jim Morrison just walked in, the singer for Molly Hatchet, Jimmy Farrar, Kim Basinger, from Def Leppard, Phil Collin, Sinead O'Connor, Nicki Minaj, and screaming comedian, Sam Kinison. Dominic Monaghan is on the Adam Carolla Show. Welcome back, Dominic. It's great to see you. Moriarty, The Devil's Game, exclusively on Audible. Yes, sir. We'll get into that. The TV series, Moonhaven as well, streaming on AMC. And, of course, Lord of the Rings, you know, Lost... I forgot about the phenomenon that was lost, Mm. but I was watching uh, This Is 40, I think it was, uh, the uh, movie. Judd Apatow movie. Judd Apatow movie, and I forgot that one of the storylines is his daughter was obsessed with Lost, and then I forgot that we were in the grips. We were all obsessed. Of Lost. Yeah. like no other show mm. in the modern era. Absolutely. Because back in the day, everyone watched I Love Lucy. But then yeah. we got all fractured off and everyone was going in different directions and all these different shows. But somehow Lost came in and just captured everyone. Yeah, yeah. I think you can put a strong argument forward to say that it was maybe the last show that people had to tune in to mm. weekly. It was Wednesday night, 7, ABC, pre-streaming. If you missed it, there's a pretty strong chance on the Thursday that someone's going to absolutely fuck the entire show <laughs> off for you. So you have to watch it. And um, Jimmy loved it. That's, Jimmy that's, Kimmel. That's probably how I kind of I think I did the first season of, of Jimmy's show and just kind of thought, okay, great to be on a talk show. Um, and then I think probably after the second or third go around with Jimmy, he was like, just want you to know that, like, this is my favorite show. Me and my, his girlfriend at the time, watch it religiously. We're in love with the show. And I was like, oh, I just thought you supported it because it's on your network and you do the show. He's like, no, no, it's my favorite show. So, it was a phenomenon. Yeah, it definitely caught fire. Yeah. Yeah, the last I, one. Yeah. I saw the finale in a 300 seat theater that was packed. It oh. was like an event. Yeah. That, like, sold tickets I, like for. a movie theater. Yeah, yeah no, ours, no ours was a movie theater. So ours no was a, a set up like that at a house party, but everyone had to be quiet. Right. No talking or you'd be kicked out. Right, right. I yeah, know. I would. I reckon it's impossible to do that now. There's mm-hmm. just too many streaming platforms and whatever. But this was the last one 
of those. I think I think yeah. it definitely has that distinction. Well, so COVID, we, we were just briefly just talking about COVID. COVID completely fried my brain, not necessarily having had COVID, which I did have, but just the experience of having COVID. I really struggle now to watch TV and movies in a way that I did pre-COVID. Like now, parceled out? Just whatever the 42 minutes of yeah. television or, or a movie, you know, two hours, <laughs> an hour and 45 I struggle to do that now. That's too much. Yeah, and it's and I'm trying to retrain my brain to do that. But I'm watching 20 minute clips of how to play League of Legends or 20 minute <laughs> clips of how to handle a cobra and stuff like that. And I, I can't watch TV like I used to. Well, we were talking last time you were in here and you're doing a show where you're traveling and handling crazy wild things, yeah. wild things, insects and cobras mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. But you weren't just a gun for hire. It was a passion of yours. Yep. Still have those animals at home. Yeah. What do you got at home? I, at the moment, I have uh, two tarantulas, praying mantis, a black widow, a beaded lizard, which is not to be confused with a bearded lizard. It's a highly venomous lizard. Hmm. And uh, two rattlesnakes. Oh, boy. Are the rattlesnakes venomous? Yep. They're all venomous. Um, yeah. I have a friend called Jules. You guys might have met Jules Sylvester. He works in the... TV and film industry, anytime they're dealing with, you know, venomous oh. hot animals, he's the guy. Jules. Hot animals. Hot home. animals, yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, Jules very often finds himself uh, taking uh, rattlesnakes out of Disneyland or Six Flags that have eaten mice or rat poison. And because of that, their digestive system is huh. messed up. So he doesn't have enough space at his place. So very often I'll take him, rehabilitate the rattlesnake, get him to the point where they're eating. You're rescuing rattlesnakes. And then take him to Joshua Tree or Palm Desert and oh, let him go. So they, um, <clears throat> they put out the rat poison, the yeah. rats eat the poison, then the snake eats the rat, then right. the snake gets sick. Yeah. Not as sick as the rat, but yeah. sick. But sick, it stops eating, and very often it will kill them eventually. So it's kind of a, a miserable death for the snake. They just stop eating because obviously in the wild, if they eat something highly poisonous, they'll just switch off their digestive system until it's better again. But with the rat poison, it doesn't happen that way, and they will die. Huh. So what you do is... So it's a little, it sounds a little gross to people that don't know how it works, but you take a, a mouse or a rat that's already been killed, you put antibiotic medicine inside it, and then you force feed the snake, the mouse or rat, and it changes their digestive It's a different system. spin on the pill pocket that you give the dog. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very different. <laughs> but, but kind of in the it's same way. Right, right. Yeah. Am I insane? Or I have some memory of the last time you were here, which was <coughs> years ago, of you having a special affinity for the ant or am I crazy? Yeah, ants are my favorite animal. I knew it. Yeah. I knew, I, I, you guys both have fantastic me. memories, the two of you. <laughs> I was just talking about ants yeah. on the show. They're incredible. The other day. You yesterday. were in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> 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 They're incredible animals, man. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of wild animals, and ants are kind of my heroes. You know, They live in very condensed environments. They look after their kids. The, the, the women come first. Everyone gets fed. There's no murder. There's no rape. They create cleaner soil, cleaner air. They're just an amazing animal. Been around for hundreds of millions of years. Yeah, they're they're kind of a metaphor for how we're supposed to do things, Society. but we we don't choose to go the ant route. Yeah, they can make themselves a raft on water. Uh huh. Yeah, like they, can they make a raft, a, raft. Yeah, a ball yeah. of of ants, right. and they float. Yeah, yeah, self sacrificing for the for the greater good. Um, yeah, they're phenomenal. I I spend a lot of my holidays just watching trails of ants go backwards and forwards and really annoying my friends. Let me uh, uh, let me tell you what I don't appreciate about rattlesnakes, but you talk me out of this. Okay. You get one, you rescue it, you nurse it back to health by doing the uh, Gainsberger routine with the antibiotic <laughs> that we used to do back in the day if you had a dog. Yeah. And at some point, you bring this rattlesnake from the brink of death to uh, robust health, so much so that you can release them in the wild at Joshua Tree. And as you release them, they try to bite you. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I mean, they... That's they, my problem. Yeah. yeah. So Sometimes they do try and bite you, um, especially if you've done something that, you know, uh, triggers them in some way. It, the more you work with those type of animals, the more you realize what is a trigger for a snake. So you imagine a snake, Natural predator for a snake is probably something like a horse or a cow, something big like cattle that's going to stamp on them. Not necessarily a human. It's not a natural predator for a snake. But they they are very jumpy around something that creates a shadow over them Mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. So if you're out in the wild, if I take my snake out in the wild and I'm taking pictures of it or something like that, I make sure that I do not put a shadow in between my snake and the snake. And I also telegraph my movements quite 
slowly. So if I'm going to, if I'm crouched and I'm going to stand up, I do it kind of slowly and make the snake know what's going on. Do this around a mm. snake, they get... Jumpy, yeah. But you, you, I want them to stay wild because if you're putting a snake back into the wild and it knows that humans are going to give it food mm. or, or keep it safe, then it's going to get in trouble. So I want it to stay kind of wild and gnarly. And then for me, it's a really, I don't necessarily subscribe. This is just a personal thing. I don't necessarily subscribe to any kind of religious group or anything like that. But my kind of spiritual path in my life has been with animals. So that moment for me of I've taken, I've taken a sick animal, been lucky enough to rehabilitate it, drive it to a place where it goes and disappears under a rock. That's a, that's a really profound kind of spiritual moment for me. And it's worth the risk of getting bitten, which never happens, but it's worth it for me. Is there such thing as devenomed snakes? Yeah, you see them a lot in India. All, all, all of the guys in India that do the dance with the snake, you know, in the basket when mm -hmm. they're, they're playing the flute. Yeah. All of those snakes have been defanged, which is terrible. It's awful for the snake. It, is there, now I know they can milk a, a snake yeah. for its venom. Yeah. Uh, but the venom would replenish itself. Yeah. yeah. So you'd have to defang it. You'd have to defang it. If you, if you milk a snake for its venom and then it bit you, there'd be a much lower amount of venom in that bite. There'd still be some venom in that bite. But yeah, they, they just tear the teeth out of, the, out of yeah. the snake of the cobra. It's not, it's an awful <laughs> existence. Because the snake is trying to be the wild snake and telling the human, you're too close, go away. But it has nothing to defend itself with. Um, yeah. So rehab, how many snakes have you done how many uh, rattlesnakes have i rehabilitated it's got to be over 20 yeah you can say any number you want well, yeah, no. No, there's no way of checking <laughs> yeah, that's true, follow that's up. True. and you've never been bitten by any animal in your I home i got bitten or? by a lizard in thailand pretty big lizard oh, a, mo a monitor lizard in oh, thailand wow Shit. it's a big scar um, big so, forearm scar yeah so what happened there monitor lizards are big they're big i mean it was like the distance between uh, myself and, and you. What, oh, my uh, God. Uh, Brian. 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 Me. Dinosaur. Uh, yeah, like a like, crocodile-sized type animal is a, 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 a water yeah. monitor lizard. <clears throat> Didn't Sharon Stone's husband get his toe bit Co off Komodo dragon. Komodo okay. dragon. Yeah, he's wearing oh. socks. Yeah. These look 100% um, prehistoric. Yeah, they've been around for hundreds of millions of years. And um, that was in a place called Kanchanaburi in... Um, Thailand, and you I, you always know, it's always the human that makes a mistake when you get bitten by an animal, and what had happened was... The you got off the plane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's I went, the I went mistake too close you to made, Donnie. <clears throat> all, um, all the ground around the lizard was this very, very dry leaf litter. So it knew, even though it were, I was in its blind spot, which is where you're supposed to be when, you, when you're working with an animal like that, it knew exactly where I was because the leaf litter was Crunching. very kind of crunchy. Yeah. And as I went over to it, it just wheeled around and bit me. And Do you remember? Did you pass out? No, it's on camera. You can see it. I don't pass out. I just kind of go, oh, shit. And I like hold my hand up mm. and it immediately starts bleeding. And then my director says, should we cut? Should we cut? But I had always said which is kind of foolhardy, but I'd always said to my crew, if I ever get bitten or stung by something, don't cut, just keep going. So I went, no, no, don't cut, don't cut. But then you see me go like yeah, gray, so but like help really me. gray. <laughs> Did they, th they have any poison or venom or yeah, something? Yes, mildly venomous, yeah, but mildly venomous. It's the bite that's more kind of scary, the, the force of its bite as opposed to its venom. But it has a, you know, in, in the way that we understand it, it has kind of a dirty mouth because it eats a lot of carrion. So there's a lot of bacteria in that. So I was on antibiotics for like two months. Stitches and everything. Yeah, right? stitches. Yeah. I don't know, 12, 14 stitches. I mean, if I may Good say scar, so. Though. Yeah, it looks cool. Yeah. It's cool, right? Yeah, yeah I kind of do. It's, and it's so much better because <laughs> everyone else has a good scar then someone wants to know the story, and it's like something involving a garage door, and it's like, blah. It's never a sword fight no. or monitor lizard. You fell or, off your bike. So uh, some did something that happened else. a long yeah. time ago right. that's not very exciting. Yeah. yeah. But the monitor lizard. Yeah. yeah. That's a that's a good one. Yeah. Do you have yeah. stuff on your list? Yes. You go Animals. Like, I yeah. want a. Here's what I want. Well, I mean, guys who collect cars or collect whatever have these like, oh, I'm looking for. A, oh yeah, yeah, a yeah. Pantera. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I, I would. Um, I'd love to free uh, swim with great whites. I'd love to free swim with blue whales. Uh, we've never seen a blue whale give birth. We've never seen blue whales uh, copulate. That would be kind of a fun thing to uh, be able to film. Uh, I'd like to work with this highly venomous octopus in uh, Australia called the Blue Ringed Pacific Octopus. Beautiful little octopus, but highly venomous. Um, 
I'd like to do that. Uh, Inland Taipan, which is arguably the world's most venomous snake in Australia. But that's because you find it in the deep, deep uh, bush of... Uh, in that in beautiful island? It's gorgeous. The deep bush of Australia. So if you get bitten by this thing, you're probably a good 10, 12 hours away from hospital. Wait, that's wait. the reason why it kills so many people. There's, oh, there's just not that many hospitals. Can't get to help. Can't get to help. So it's, the, uh, it's stunning. It's so beautiful. I feel like there's more swimming with great whites now I, I think than so. ever. Because when I was a kid... You were either not in the water or in a cage. Yeah, they yeah. put you in the oh, cage. Gosh. They put you in a cage, yeah. and then which was bigger than my bedroom at the time. So I was like, "Wow, <laughs> I can live well, that's bad digs." <laughs> yeah. And then there was always a shark was always ramming the Thrashing, cage, yeah. and we built up a pretty good case against them. But yeah. it, it turns out you can swim with them. You can if if you're working with the right people, and then and you you know about their behavior. It's a lot about body language with, with wild animals and certainly with great whites. You can see when they're kind of annoyed and switched on and getting ready to attack and then other times they're just kind of exploring a little bit and it's kind of the controlling the snout is the key thing. So as they come towards you, you, you have to redirect their snout, obviously, away from <laughs> you and they just kind of lose interest. But you don't want them... It, when I go diving um, for the nature show that I did... Very often, if you're in shark territory, you wear a mask on the back of your head uh -huh. because if, if they think you can see them, they won't attack. Uh -huh. They're kind of opportunistic kind of bullies a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if you, t if you take that off and they're behind you, they're going to have a go at you. But you put the mask on, on the back of your head, they're like, oh, I'll just wait for an opportunity. Is they, it true that you can flip them over and they'll pass out or something? Yeah, they go into like this thing called ptosis where they need water to be flowing over their, their gills. And if you flip them over, they just kind of go into like a toxic yeah, so just shock. flip it over. The, it's how uh, killer whales Robert's kill them belly. very often. Oh, it's oh, wow. how killer whales kill killer, them. Killer whales will often grab one of their side dorsal fins and just flip them upside down, and then they'll just hang there and they'll eat them. The uh, the ones that breach are insane. Crazy. That's off the northern coast here somewhere, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, there's a lot in Catalina, and Catalina is a real uh, diver's paradise for people learning how to scuba dive, and Catalina Island is a heavily uh, great white shark uh, era, era. Oh, really? Yeah, it's full of great white shark. Well, I've, all the, uh, I've been there swimming yeah. just off the boat a lot. <laughs> yeah, because it is no beautiful. Point, right? It's gorgeous. Yeah, they do this thing where they go, the great whites don't eat people because that's not on their, their diet, but my, I don't know what the Maybe big difference the between the seal and us is. Maybe more blubber. Well, they especially like if you're, fat. and if you're wearing like black lycra, you probably look like one. Yeah, and also they might not eat you, but it's still going to be a real problem if they take your leg off at the thigh and right. they go, "Oh no, I'm not going to eat you." You're yeah. like, "Well, now I'm fucked," you know, because I cannot swim back to the boat. Yeah, the breaching ones are. Have you seen that, uh -uh. Janet? You've oh. never seen the ones a breach? Shark breach? No. Well, speaking of being sneaky, what the, the seals kind of swim up around the surface and the sharks go low and then they go up. Death from below. And That's extraordinary. They come from they come at a great velocity, and even though they're uh, two thousand pounds, mm -hmm. they go airborne. Yeah. It's Damn. it's uh much like Watching uh, Refrigerator Perry take the ball into the end zone back then. Yeah. You didn't know something that big could move that fast. Oh, I mean, it must be like getting hit by a car. You must get knocked unconscious, you know. If it's they go sailing into the air. Yeah, which, They're insane. bigger than I thought they were. A fully grown one can be like 18, 19 feet. Jeez. Yeah, it's a terrifying animal. And 2,000 pounds plus? Yeah, I would think a big one is probably that big. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, which That's is insane. insane. The good to, news, to like I said, airborne. if it gets a human like that, I'm sure that impact you're knocked out. I'm sure yeah, you won't remember being killed <laughs> and <laughs> no, eaten no, alive. No, <laughs> digested. <laughs> <laughs> so you got uh, swim with the great whites. Swimming uh, blue uh, whales, the, the largest animal on the planet. I why mean, don't we have documentation of what blue whales, you know, mating? Yeah. And and giving birth and, and things of that nature. Like, I, I know the ocean is unexplored, but I feel like everyone has a fucking wet, dry GoPro <laughs> at this point. And everyone's somewhere. Like, yeah. wouldn't sure. we have? Yeah, you would think. Why do we not? Do they do it at some depth the or theory, something? The theory behind it is they're doing all this stuff at very uh, deep ocean. Like, it's the reason why you don't see... Um, giant squid and sperm whales get into fights. You see sperm whales come up to the surface of the water covered in scars from these epic battles that they get into with giant squid, but we've never seen that either. And all of these things are happening in these really deep ocean trenches, and that is supposedly where blue whales are mating and giving birth. Shit gets down and dirty. Yeah, what there. is up with the, is it the uh, sperm whale, did you say, in the giant squid? Sperm whale and the giant squid. What do the sperm whales live off of? 
giant squid. Oh, that's it. Oh, well, <laughs> that's <what> yeah. <laughs> well, I'll retract that question. Then you got to you got to mix it up. Yeah, I read or I watched something on Instagram. I think actually about why it's called a sperm whale is pretty gross. But tell me if this is accurate. Like, there's stuff in their head yeah. that looks like sperm so they thought it was sperm whale but what is that stuff in their head um yeah i don't know what that stuff they're is. blaming their parents that's right <laughs> also if as long as we're on the subject i've long um sort of jokingly but also not really wanted to get the word out that like dolphins can rape people they rape each other yes um they're not like the very like cute adorable animals that we think they are like they're very fucking gnarly to like Female dolphins. Yeah. And they'll, can you just back me up on this? Definitely happens. Definitely documented uh, cases of both male and female dolphins getting kind of frisky and horny and trying to do stuff to people. Uh, you know, most of the time, usually the person is not swimming naked, but I think mm. if the person was swimming naked, they can get in trouble. There's also like, there's a guy off the coast of Wales, which is a country connected mm. to England, that got prosecuted for having relations with oh, a wild Lord. dolphin. That, wouldn't that take his rectum right out? I don't know. What, oh, boy. Well, who was on top? Well, that's a good <laughs> question. I don't know. So, I'm yeah. so intrigued with the giant squid going at it with the sperm whale. Yeah, yeah. That's an epic battle, man. I didn't know. Well, I know there's killer whales. I yeah. thought they were all about crawl and small little plankton-y things. No, I, didn't, I didn't know they dined on giant squid. So these... The, you have these uh, whales called baleen whales that have these very distinctive kind of mouth openings that looks more like a sieve, something that they're actually siphoning something mm -hmm, through. Right. All those guys eat the largest animals in the world, eat the smallest animals in the world. Right. But the, the, the whales that actually have mouths, they're eating big creatures. They're eating dolphins. They're eating, you know, uh, massive squid. Whatever your mouth can fit. Whatever you can fit, yeah. But it is interesting that like the blue whale, the biggest animal to have ever lived on the planet, eats one of the smallest living creatures, krill. Imagine how much of that they need to eat on a daily basis. That's crazy. Yeah, they're just a big um, Roomba but that, <laughs> robot that just I mean, skims along the surface of the ocean. Just but drains seeing it all out. that, I mean, it's extraordinarily big. I think the biggest thing I've been in the ocean with is the whale shark, which is the biggest fish in the world, but that's probably eight, ten times smaller than a blue whale. And a blue whale is harmless, although if it swishes its tail at you, it can obviously kill you. But just being in the ocean and seeing something like that come <sighs> towards you must be absolutely breathtaking. Well, the whale sharks, no no joke either. I no, mean, huge. they're huge. And they got the word shark in them. Right in yeah. uh, but, yeah. you know, when you're in the ocean and you're swimming around and you see a 12 pound fish it looks massive mm -hmm. yeah. i don't know if it's being magnified or it's yeah. your brain or whatever it is but i could only imagine being in front of a whale shark which is 40 feet or yeah yeah something big, big adult ones are massive yeah i mean look at that in comparison to the diver there i would uh takes your breath away totally takes your breath away. once in a while a giant squid washes up mm -hmm. that's about all we got right yeah. yeah somewhere somebody finds a giant squid we never really see them in the wild do we no they spend most of their time in very deep ocean and they're pretty strictly uh, nocturnal as well so both those two factors means that we don't see them that much and ones that wash up that we see is kind of crazy because most of the time obviously if they die in the ocean they get eaten before they get washed up so it's weird that they would be that shallow mm -hmm. and get washed up so you don't see them that much but again strange. what are they eating uh they're probably eating you know again anything they can get hold of small fish um why well, are they hanging stuff. around in those depths? Mm. Safer? Oh, yeah. That's where all their bodies are. Well, we've never out. seen one. Safer. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty safe from us. Yeah. And the giant Japanese squid is like... whaling ships, I like, can't no. can't get to them. Yeah, exactly. That's like the stuff of lore though. You think of the giant squid and that's like that's like in cave paintings. I mean, like that seems to be the most fantastical thing we think about when we think of what's under the water. Yeah, I thought it was a myth when I was a little yeah. kid. I thought it was like, you know, some sort of, you know, creature that we've created ourselves. But obviously they exist. They're just extremely shy, extremely rare. And um, yeah, it's another fascinating creature. Mm. I love them when they wash up on the beach. And you have like a scale of someone like stood next to them going, oh. <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> it's as close as we get to a sort of, fictional modern day monster yeah you know yeah. what i mean like you know apes and you know even 
you know, Sasquatch or something, like two arms, two legs, got the head, you know, whatever. They're kind of, we can imagine that. This yeah. is outer space alien stuff, yeah. but on the on the beach. Yeah. I don't know, Gina, what is the biggest one that... Uh, the biggest the, undersea creature? The biggest giant squid that oh. washed up. And it's sad that we're living in a world where we have GoPros and ring doorbell cameras everywhere, but we can't get any yeah, wild, mm. giant maybe squid. Maybe if you were to bring it up from the depths of the ocean, it might die as well. Mm. If they're living uh, that deep oh, down, the pressure. it might be the pressure, yeah. Holy shit. So j- the first thing I pull up from ocean.si.edu, giant squid love up to their name, largest giant squid ever recorded, 43 feet long and weighed nearly a ton. And here's a picture of just these tiny little ants, which are people standing yeah. around this giant what thing. What people don't uh, r- fully appreciate about uh, 43 feet is it's a four-story building. Right. Yeah. So that's stand, right. walk into a four-story building, stop look and, up. and look up. That's the, that's the length of the squid. Yeah, that's nuts. Have you, have you guys been on safari? No. Um, so <laughs> Our lives suck. I saw a beast. <laughs> It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a great it's a great thing to do, but like it's it's interesting because obviously we are slightly used to the noises that maybe animals might make in our local area at night. You'll hear coyotes going yeah. off. Maybe you'll hear the occasional owl or you know two cats having a fight. But if it's pitch black on safari and you hear lions, you can understand why people would think there were monsters in the dark. It's just a noise that like vibrates through your entire being it doesn't sound like a, an animal that you could understand it's, it's it sounds like a monster it's a monstrous noise you know and obviously people in africa get used to it all the time but the first time i heard it i was like what the fuck was that like, oh it's a lion i was like oh okay do you feel better or I'm, i wouldn't <laughs> i mean yeah you you you're aware that you're protected in the place that you're right. sleeping but it's it's a crazy noise, and safari is an amazing experience. It's what really is weird. a give us and and my listeners a starter for Ferraris? Safari, a starter a safari. Like you go, never been, may never, may only go on one. Yeah, uh, don't have all the money in the world. Yeah, don't have all the time in the world. What was the one that we should go on? I would say the best, probably beginner. Uh, safari place is Kenya. Go to Nairobi, fly to Nairobi, and then you know probably do some research beforehand, and do one of the fifteen to twenty safaris that they do out of Nairobi. And within that first couple of hours of your safari, you're seeing zebra, zebra, giraffes, <laughs> uh, good news. What do you call them? wildebeest? News. Mm-hmm. News. Uh, lions. Um, you know, everything that you would think in a zoo, you're just like, oh, they're just hanging around here like elephants. I could not believe that I, you know, at some point on the first or second day, you see a herd of elephants. You're like, wow, they're just hanging around here. They're like, yeah, they're just like sparrows or like pigeons that you might see. They're just There's lying around. nothing cuter on the planet than a baby elephant. Yeah, pretty amazing. Also, if you really want to go budget, just go to the Roar and Snore at San Diego Zoo. Oh, Sleep right. over there. They, Ooh, you can do, do that too. That. They used to have Lion Country Safari oh, in right. Irvine, California, yes. wow. we were talking about. Wow. Picture Irvine, the hills of Irvine, and lions Damn. wandering around as you drove through. That in was your a safari car. park. They you, shut that down now. They shut it down. We we Imagine looked Peter we looked into it. it. Uh, Irvine Meadows, the amphitheater was built somewhere around there, and uh, yeah, you could drive around in your car and look at lions <laughs> and like zebra and everything. Just walking around. Wow. What, what could that possibly was, go wrong? I mean, we're looking at a picture. <laughs> oh, sh- <laughs> sugar that's, plum. That is Irvine from like 1967 wow. or something. At least the cars look from the 50s and the 60s. And yep. uh, they just have a bunch of lines walking around. That's gnarly. It'd be hard to pull that permit today. Yeah, it definitely would. <laughs> it definitely would. Yes. I, I think maybe in the next kind of, who knows, 50, 75 years, something like that, I'm hoping that zoos might kind of revise what animals they have in their uh, habitats. You know, I don't think you should be having large mammals, large cats, bears um, in zoos. My idea for a zoo uh, in the future is, because some animals do okay in confined spaces, lots of invertebrates, lots of reptiles, lots of fish. They do fine in confined spaces. I have a lizard at home that has a tank, probably about half the size of this table, and invariably it sleeps in a spot this size. And I'm always like, 
taken it out and it comes right back and just sleeps for like three weeks until I put food in there. So some animals do well in small spaces. But like a polar bear, for instance, does not do well in small spaces. But in a zoo in the future, you could maybe go over to the section that's the polar bear section, see a piece of polar bear fur, see maybe a, a, a polar bear claw, learn about, you know, hopefully at this point where polar bears live and, and what they do and see some video of a polar bear, a little interactive experience, and then move on to an animal that does okay in a confined space. I was in a zoo in, in England called Chester Zoo near Liverpool with my little nephew when he was like four or five obsessed with animals. And there was a black panther habitat, like, I don't know, 30 or 40 school kids banging on the glass. Mm -hmm. And this black panther was sat in the middle of the enclosure just panting oh. through right. stress, just yeah. panting, like I, I, like a, an incredibly powerful wild animal surrounded by tiny little kids Taunted. going, do something, do something. Mm. And this cat's just like, oh, just kill me, just kill me, uh. just kill me. It's so sad, so well, yeah. sad. You're right about the interactive experience because in Mammoth at the, at the top of the mountain, which I'm sh sure you've been to, yeah. um, you know, where everybody skis, I don't, so I was chilling up there. But they have all that, you can touch the fur, they have like the poop from like, you know, dinosaurs. You can have like woolly mammoth stuff. Yeah, all kinds yeah. of stuff. And it's, it's awesome. And you can touch, you know, fur of, you know, pelts and stuff that still exists, but you don't have to cage it to do it. It's, it was actually really cool. Yeah, I, I think that's cool too. And hopefully we'll get there with zoos. I mean, you know, good zoos are zoos that have great um, kind of research programs, breeding programs, stuff like that for animals that are in trouble. But I, I really do think, you know, what we know now about a gorilla, a chimpanzee, an orangutan, a lion, a polar bear, an elephant, you put an elephant in an enclosure, like you see these elephants just losing Trudging. their marbles. It's so sad that we do that to them, you know? Yeah. Dominic, We've talked about all kinds of venomous animals. I believe last time you were here, we talked about ayahuasca. Mm, did you go do that? No, hell no, okay. but I still want to. Yeah, you um, should. What scares you? What scares me? Um, what scares me? I'm not great around. I'm not great around heights. I'm not oh. great. But I, you know, it's not stopped me from like bungee jumping or, uh, you know, trying trying sure. to get better at heights by sure. doing silly stuff around heights. But I'm, I'm not great. Sometimes I've gone, you know, hiking in the desert with friends and I have a couple of friends uh, that will like get to the edge of those kind of mm -hmm. desert rocks and be kind of like, hey, come do it. And I'm like, no, that's not for me. And especially if they start messing around yeah. in those places. And I'd also like you to come back. Like, oh, now yeah. you just, you know, and you'll, you'll be silly and it'll be funny until it's not funny. And right. I don't want to be here for that. So, yeah, I'm not great around heights. Don't okay. ask me the question, Gina. Adam, what scares Black you? people. <laughs> So, so it's, fun, it's funnier if you answer before yeah, you finish. That's right. Don't go on question. safari. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Hey, uh, by the way, uh, Bubbles the Hippo escaped three times from Lion Country Safari. Good. Wow. Yeah. Three right. times, fool. And died during the oh. third capture. Yeah, I don't like that. Recapture. 4,000 so. pounds. And uh, so the Bubbles found refuge in a rain filled pond, oh. eluded capture yeah. for 19 days. And then they uh, was taken down with a bunch of tranquilizer darts, uh. tragically collapsed uh, in an unnatural position and died from suffocation. I, I can't hear this. Uh, it gets worse. No. no. <laughs> it gets worse than the fact that he died? Yeah. It was raped violently by the zoo uh, people. By dolphins. <laughs> an autopsy revealed she was five months pregnant. Oh, oh, no. Yeah. That's awful. Just kill me. <laughs> Bubble. <laughs> it, okay. Hold on. That's a, awful. A hippo. Just think about this, those who go to, you know, the Irvine Improv and watch a show um, or head out that way and um, go to the favorite restaurant or whatever. A hippo escaped in Orange County <laughs> and was on the lamb for three weeks That's before they found it. Uh, how? Imagine how confused that animal was. Uh, know, this is horrible. But it's also what I, you know, I was saying an hour ago. I, I was out in Chatsworth in the eighties. There was land Room. open, yeah. you know, Spawn Ranch. Yeah. You know, it was just open. Uh, Orange County was open. Like this wow. is this is in the sixties, the seventies, or something like. I mean, seventy eight. Wow. This is almost into the 80s, mm -hmm. and there was a hippo in Orange County who managed to elude. Uh, wow. the, the officials that's that were insane. looking for it. It's a, I mean, obviously a, a terrified animal, but that's an extremely dangerous animal. Kills more people on the continent of Africa than any other animal apart from the mosquito. Isn't it because Two of just tons. their jaw? 
Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a very powerful territorial animal. So if you get anywhere near it, it will Oof. charge you and bite you. Again, a super cute baby. Bubbles, the hippo. Cute. All right, we'll take a break. Dominic, you hang out. We'll do some okay, news no. right after this. I know people who love podcasts and follow along to a lot of stories uh, have been very much impacted by this. And who knows, maybe someday we'll save somebody. So if you're familiar with the name Adnan Syed, he was the man whose murder conviction of his ex uh, high school girlfriend was the subject of the podcast Serial Mm -hmm. a few years ago. It was a phenomenon. Um, He had his conviction vacated uh, yesterday. So the decision freed him. He's now 41 years old. He was in prison for 23 years fighting this conviction that he murdered his former classmate, uh, Heyman Lee. And he could even have, they offered him a plea in 2018. He said, no, I'm not guilty. I had a semi-related discussion with my 16-year-old son last night while we're eating. Please tell him not to kill his girlfriend. He got into, his girlfriend's going to kill him for sure. Um he got into D.B. Cooper, you know, mm. and then uh, talking about it. They never found him. Mm-hmm. And they found some money in a there river. There's a new doc on Netflix mm-hmm. or yeah. something. Yeah. It's oh, okay. is that, is that yeah, what it, it is? Wasn't, wasn't oh, there's a new, yeah, there's a newish one. Yeah. Oh, is it called? It wasn't, it wasn't great. D.B. Cooper? Of, uh, it kind of goes over everything that we know about D.B. Cooper. It doesn't really get into anything that interesting. Well, he was kind of, he was getting interested. And then he said to me, uh, you know any of that stuff? And I said, yeah, I kind of, kind of like that stuff. And then he started saying, like, you know, but the, the true crime stuff yeah. like that. And I said, I don't, I don't like it when people are murdered. You know, I don't mind the capers stuff the as heist, much. Heist. Yeah. The heist and stuff. But the, the horrible murders, because I was maybe telling him about the interviewing the uh, detective with the, uh, with the Golden, Golden State, uh, you know, all that stuff. And I said, I, I don't, it's so, it's so attractive to women. Women, mm. you know, moth to the flame. Mm-hmm. It's not like they like it. It's like they need it or something. Right. But I said, I, I don't like the idea of being entertained by people who died. And even though you're not laughing, you're still kind of being sure. entertained by it. Right. But then how come every man I know is obsessed with World War II? I like World War II question. from the. It's a lot of lot of heavy genocide. I like it from the equipment standpoint. Okay. Like I love all the airplanes oh, really? and the tanks and. What I, was that used for? To kill people. <laughs> <laughs> but from twenty thousand feet. Right, oh, buddy, I'm with you. <laughs> I like the technology of it. Like I, when you when you talk to most guys, I think about let's say the atom bomb, yeah. Hiroshima, Nagasaki. Right. I think they're more intrigued with the technology mm. of the bomb rather than excited about 90,000 people killed in one fell swoop. Mm-hmm. Like they're they're more yeah. I think into this weird race mechanical race I yeah. part so. of it. I'm I hope s- so. I'm still fascinated with how someone's mind was able to put all that energy into that contained space and then safely travel it over waters and drop it on someone. That's Still fascinating to me yeah. how someone was able to go, oh, I think I've worked out how to do that. Like, I don't know how to do that. It, it's the whole, I mean, the whole thing's mind-blowing. Mm. I mean, we, we, you know, people go like, they go, you know, we we dropped two bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And like, we tested eight of them on our soil. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> someone in Nevada is still fucked you up. You made a perfect point. We never talk about those. You talk yeah. about the ones that kill all the people. You've talked endlessly. I know that will come up next week about ball turret gunners mm-hmm. and how amazing that was. And they just fucking killed people on the sky. The reason that technology is interesting is it was so effective at doing whatever job it was. A tank, a ball turret gunner, whatever. An atomic bomb. It killed tons of people. Thus, it was amazing technology yeah it's concentric circles yeah 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 ball turrets always well ball turret always just pisses me off because a ball turret gunners the ball turret pisses me off because of what a ball turret gunner could do in 1944 and then you'd come back stateside and you turn on a professional football game and we had a goal post that had two posts going all the way down. We didn't have the technology to do the single the post one. in the middle. Like, we couldn't weld. It was in the end like, zone. I, yes, there were two posts cemented into the end zone. Two. You doubled your chance of being concussed by a, a steel post. We couldn't even figure out the one. But I'm just, I'm just saying it would always bother me that 
We had the ball turret yeah. gunner, and we didn't really have containers to keep food fresh. Right. You know, yeah. like Tupperware was <laughs> brand new, and there's nothing else on the scene. We didn't have ways to transport a cat. We had a box. <laughs> you had to put cats in a box. Put a hole in it. We didn't have a way to move animals. You know, it's got a mesh and a zipper yeah, and a thing great. and it folds I'd out. We had nothing. Yeah. But a box. But I was like, but we had a ball turret. <laughs> was the ball turret guy not in charge of seeing anything? The ball. He saw everything. He saw everything. It looked like he saw much. He sat in the outside of the plane in the belly of the plane and oh, rotated this ball around you know 180 degrees and side to his, side he's and kind of on his back he's all laying down on his back firing a 50 caliber machine gun at, like at Nazi stuff, right? airplanes I mean, oh, obviously he's on comms right so he can chat to the plane they above. Yes, he's, he wants to when, when but he's he, not getting out oh when when they land he's getting out that's it yeah when the, when the Pilot says uh, bad news, but the hydraulics are out. We can't deploy the landing gear. He hears it. He can't get out, but he's aware of it. Yeah. In a tragic mistake, they made the uh, wheels just this much shorter That's than right. the balter. No, they did have to land some of those. Yeah, with that guy under the plane. Wow. Because oh, what are you going to do? Yeah. Some Star Wars stuff right there. Yeah. But I agree with you in terms of the true crime stuff. I have quite a few pals who are girls who uh, fall asleep at night to like the the, the first 48. Yeah. Like you're falling asleep to true murder cases? <laughs> it's got to give you weird dreams. Like, oh, it's kind of nice, you know? Like, no, it's not nice. Ask me why we do it. Okay, why do you do it? I don't know. <laughs> Nobody knows. There's no answer. There's Is no it the answer. feeling of, of being Is uh, it Sean unsafe Freud? Well, knowing that you're yeah, safe? We ex I've talked about this before. Listening to those and scary movies and all that shit, it's the same thing. It's it's exactly like you just said. It's the feeling that you get of being in danger, knowing full well you are not in danger. However, <laughs> these are true crimes. Mm -hmm. Right. So It uh, could be you. Like yeah. 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 Right. Don't exactly. watch horror movies. I mean, there's some horror movies that I think are masterpieces, but as a general rule, I, I don't watch horror movies. There's that film Barbarian out right now, which is like the number one film in the yeah. States, horror yeah. movie. It's got really good reviews. All it my is. girl pal friends have gone see it, to see it, and they're like, you want to see it? I'm like, oh, no. I don't. I don't know. I'm not familiar thing. with it. I don't dig on the jump scare. Every girl pal has gone to see Pearl. <laughs> Pearl's What's that? <laughs> What's Pearl? It's another horror film that's out right now. It's got 94% of Rotten Tomatoes. I saw it. It's very good. It, it it's, is? It's a genre picture. If you like horror movies, you'll love it. Life is a scary place. I don't necessarily yeah. need to walk myself into scary he things because of it. He handles venomous yeah. lizards and snakes. Your life He's is a horror done. movie. He's good. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, in a twist of irony, because this story is just, the, the headlines are so delicious that it's, it's everywhere right now. An executive at a company that makes fake meat products uh, from plants was arrested for biting off a man's Knows. Oh. I heard about this. Yeah, Douglas oh, Ramsey. Sweet irony. <laughs> Douglas Ramsey, he's the COO of Beyond Meat. He's been charged with terroristic threatening to kill well, and third degree battery. Wasn't it a football game? Yes. Sort of. Oh, yes, and. So. Yes, and. Uh, police officers responded to the scene to discover two men with bloody faces. So the incident <sighs> occurred following a college football game. Ramsey and another driver got into some road rage, uh, bumping into each other, this, you know, bumper to bumper traffic leaving the university. They started getting heated. Uh, Ramsey got upset at the Subaru driver creeping into his exit lane. He jumped out of his car, punched through the back windshield of the Subaru and smacked the driver. The two men then fought until the cops arrived. The cops uh, report indicates that Ramsey bit the Subaru owner's nose, ripping the tip. Wow. So Subaru is a pretty good percentage car to attack the driver. You know, <laughs> Nowadays. Stay away from El Camino. Mm. Oh, I see. Custom vans. We're powered by love and kisses. Mm. Ram oh, trucks. Exactly 50s. Yeah, stay we away from dualies yeah. and, and trucks that have yeah. racks or, or bed boxes on yeah. them. You know, right. go, go to short, Subaru. it's high or low. <laughs> yeah, Subaru is a smart, a smart money. I'll try to, I can kick this lesbian's ass but <laughs> sometimes you run into a tough customer yeah now here's the question did they win did their team win or lose i does i'm telling you right now it doesn't matter i've leaving college football games is a fucking disaster there's always too few exits there's always 
five lanes of people funneling into one lane. A win or lose, you're, it's a nightmare. There's a lot of people. But I'm talking about game, more right? about yeah. the demeanor of oh, the God. person. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. The loss. I understand. I'm put saying you in the mood. traffic but transcends. You know how you people, uh, being males, like to be like, my team, that's my guy on my team. I'm assuming the Subaru driver's team won because he was feeling kind of chuffed and thought he could cut in front of everybody because it's his team. Mm. It That's f- my guess. It fact it factors in. Yeah, yeah, we were trying to leave the University of Texas game, what, two weeks ago, Chris? And, yeah. and we sat in a above ground <laughs> parking structure on the top floor for no, yeah. an hour. We didn't went nowhere. Mm. Didn't move an inch. Yeah. It didn't move an inch. But I will say losing in that fashion by one point made the weight all that much yeah, worse, I think, yeah. for those partisans sure. around yeah, me. You're right. And uh, it may have been more likely to yeah. dice it up with somebody. Yeah. C- I think can I right. ask you guys? Because in England, <clears throat> if you let someone uh, into your lane in traffic or do something courteous in traffic, it is absolutely mandatory to just say thank you. I always give if you wave. If you don't yeah. in England, it's a problem. What's the what's the the protocol? Just the wave? Uh, just a wave. Yeah. yeah you no, know, whatever. If you put your hand out the window, that's great. Or a little wave in your rearview mirror. Mm-hmm. But something to say thank you very much. In Ca- is it just California or is it just LA that it's not mandatory? The Midwest. I'm from Kansas, and you always wave. And my mom will even s- it will say thank you into her mirror as though they can <laughs> see her. <laughs> so it's very it's Midwestern. But yeah, I don't think the coast give a shit about it's, the thank you. It's unusual for people to say yes. thank you yeah. in LA, right? Yes. Do you guys We're, all say thanks when oh, Adam? Do you? Oh yeah, I'm a big. Okay. I I. <laughs> I'm a waver. I'm, I Same. move out of the way for motorcycles. Drivers. We're assertive drivers. Sure. Right? We're so assertive, but I'm always waving, and I'm always making a berth for the motorcycle as who's Same. splitting Same. splitting Same. the lane. Yeah. Now I I'm telling the you, point. the low point, the motorcycle, low point me. motorcycle guys are down eighty six percent though. But to get it, it's nice. It's like the well, now ice cream. it's a four leaf clover. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the day, common occurrence: guy split, you made a berth, hand went out. Yeah. Now. Used to get it eight out of ten times. Now you get it two out of ten yeah. times. Yeah. It's it's gone down. Yeah. Look, people, everyone in L.A. is a narcissist. They came here from somewhere else, not mm-hmm. to be courteous, but to try to launch a country singing career or yeah. write screenplays or whatever. <laughs> so you have a lot of self-absorbed sure. people that are just here trying to get their own shit done. So yeah. you get a, a lot less of the community stuff worked in. It's- it's very upsetting. I remember my mom telling me when she was dropping me off for of school once, she was like, she wanted a device in her car that if she let someone out and they didn't wave, the hook picks up the car and puts them behind Oh, my. I love I was that. Like, oh, I like aggressive so mama. Great, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a great good. invention. Yeah, I don't know where you guys are at. I'm all for waving somebody past. I don't like when somebody is doing it for you because they're in front of you like occasionally you'll be driving along the street and someone will want to be like jaywalking and mm. someone in front of you will just stop and start like waving mm. it's like i didn't agree to this <laughs> that I person should just wait until it's clear or go to the signal or yeah. like whatever yeah. at the game i didn't know i never go to college football games it was explained that the courteous people on the stacked parking we we're at the very top back into the spot because when the game ends, That's everyone great. can now just fold out yes. into yes. it. Oh, yeah. But inevitably, you're behind somebody to some asshole that didn't back into the spot, and then the person stops, and they're like waving them, and they're doing the uh-uh. three-point, and they're like, uh-uh. hey, I didn't agree to this. We're on the same page here. He didn't back in. You stay till the end. Now we're all stopping, and you're being courteous, but you're forcing me to get, be courteous, but I don't get any of the accolades. Yeah. Yeah. You get the wave. That's yeah. right. I'm a hostage. <laughs> nothing <laughs> more, nothing less. <laughs> a simple hostage. I'm here against my will. <laughs> That's right. Well, starting in 2027, Californians are going to have a different burial option. And I think oh. a lot of people are going to get on board with Please this. Say Viking funeral. No, but Newsom did sign Stand a bill up. that allows human composting. Oh. Mm-hmm. So it's AB 351. It allows for the method in which human remains naturally decompose over a 30 to 45 day period and are turned into soil. And then the human composted soil can be returned to the family or donated to conservation land. It is kind of crazy. We still bury people in, in coffins. So, well, uh, supporters say it's environmentally friendly. It's a different approach to the traditional end-of-life options. And there are already states who do, that do this. Washington, Colorado, Oregon, and Vermont already yeah, do this it. This story was out of Washington, I think, 
a couple of years ago. The pods, the tree pods. Oh, the tree yeah, pods. they're like right, yeah. standing up. Yeah. Weren't they lined with some sort of fertilizer or something to get the growing? They they guarantee that for like the next year and a half to two years or something that 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 tree will be taken care of and then the rest of it is like go with God, whatever, like do do what happens naturally. But yeah, it's a tree for at least a couple of years and then you see. And I have to give it to my people. I think the Jews are already sort of doing that. There's no embalming. It's a pine box. It's it's back into the earth as you were. There's there's none of that. Go vertical. Because I like vertical. ditch digging's a pain in the ass, mm-hmm. and I know they'll do it with a backhoe now, but you can get a caisson rig. It's just a giant auger bit. <laughs> they use it. You're really for, taking the beauty out of this. They use it for a lot of foundation work. We got to drop yeah, the caisson. The bedrock. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, they just, you know, they make them all different sizes. You just zip, zip, yeah, zip, punch right. holes. And you could get 13 people yeah. buried in the space you did three mm-hmm. when you lay them out flat and do mm-hmm. the big dig, mm-hmm. ditch yeah, dig and all yeah. that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Is there any is there any uh, religious uh, qualms with going vertical? Anybody care? I think the problem is, is people are, are so narcissistic and they talk about not accepting death. You know, mm-hmm. they, they go like... Well, we're going to get a nice coffin, and we'll, we'll line it with some padding. Oh. You know what I mean? And we'll we'll have this quilting. This is the Cadillac of caskets. Yeah. Adam, you love napping, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, a imagine if you pillow. nap for eternity. As versus the referendum on how you felt about the Yeah, line. versus I don't want to stand in line my whole life. <laughs> so I'm in eternity, I'm standing there like I'm in some line. bakery where I never get bust. to the counter. <laughs> That's a good point. Also, everyone would want to be on top, right? You wouldn't oh, want to sure. be the, uh, anywhere but the the closest to the. Oh, we're sword. talking about oh, stacking. You're, going so you're, you're, going, you're stacking them like Pez. Oh, you're doing, you're doing you're this. Right. I was doing this. Yeah. yeah, I don't want some douche standing on my shoulders for yeah. eternity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was figuring just dropping them, dropping them yeah. like eight feet. You know, leave about two feet of headspace there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great idea, um, and and I've gotten to the point where like. I don't care. Like when the meat suit is done being used, do with it what Burn you will. Burn me up. I don't give it. I don't care. Did you guys uh, see the little queen's funeral? Did you see her? So long. Yeah. Tiny, tiny, tiny little coffin. It was teeny. Tiny. So I mean, she was a small lady anyway. <laughs> and then she obviously got smaller and smaller as she became 96. But her coffin was, I thought, noticeably small. She had a custom made Jaguar hearse. Of course I fucking <laughs> love that car. Fifth uh, most richest woman in the world. I'm Isn't such a car? car guy that I was like looking at it. Then I oh, started saw looking that. at the hearse. Chrissy and I was, saw it. She's like, they don't make that. Beautiful. No, vehicle. they don't make it. It's a beautiful. It'd make <laughs> a hell of an SUV, third row. It, it, but the color. It was yeah, badass. The color of it, which was this kind of eggplant, Merlot, mm-hmm. kind of just this mm-hmm. deep burgundy. We're going to find that. Egg. It was a Squinic. beautiful. It was, it was stunning. Was it that dark? It was, it was, uh, it was burgundy esque, yeah. I think. Mm. Also, the the visibility would actually be great on safari because the oh, you would actually be able to see that's all right. the rails. Oh, the now entire, we're talking. It was a beautiful that the Pope mobile. And somebody, some true craftsman, got out the English wheel and shaped <laughs> that steel. Yeah, it was a beautiful. I, that's all I was thinking the whole time. So, well, God, what a ride! Say what you want about the Queen of England, but. She did have quite impeccable taste. Mm. She did. She, I mean, you know, she had great taste in purses and handbags and had a nice kind of suit and all that kind of stuff. Colonies. And I did think that everything about that funeral was just yeah, a little level of sophistication. You don't see that often, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. They keep it classy over they there. They do keep it classy. Including Jaguar, who built a fucking hell of a hearse. Yeah. It was I sweet. mean. <laughs> Now, well, oh, that yeah! Look at that. Yeah. That's a dramatic. It's not car. even. There's better. There's pictures in the sunlight. You'll yeah. find some. It's, it looks like it's raining, but you'll raining, see some think. pictures in the <laughs> sunlight of, during the procession as it was sort of going along. Yeah. You'll see that look like ten coats of hand rubbed lacquer. Yeah, that's what so, I was, so that's that's a, that's a custom made car, Adam. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, what so, is there like no, five of those on the planet still, or something? There might be one. Do I, they I hang know. on to that for? Uh, Charles? For the next one? Yeah. yeah, probably. Yeah, Charles, like, keep it running. <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. 
<laughs> you never know. Yeah, he's it, Is it like a very deep royal uh, purple? You gotta That's, find the. You'll that find was it. my recollection. Yeah. It was like like Tyrone Hill, the old basketball player. So black, it's. Purple. I wonder oh, if okay. those top two right, sunroofs go back. I to be <laughs> fair, I was watching it on TV, and yeah. sometimes TV can muss with yeah. things. But I saw a picture where the sun was hitting the fender, and it looked it like, like a glow, one of my burgundy. favorite colors of very deep burgundy, mm-hmm. and it looked so. Great, but the lines look great. Like we'll yeah, find a it's beautiful, find yeah. an on the ground a spoiler picture on the of back it. There, right? Would that be yeah. <laughs> coined a spoiler? That thing on the back? I don't know, but Probably you're right with the glass. That. The glass is amazing. All yeah. right, one more half a more, Gina. Okay, well let's talk toys real quick because some of well some of you are you didn't have toys, but some of many people's favorite childhood games are going to be honored at the 2022. Toy Hall of Fame, and I thought I'd just give oh, you the boy. list. Uh, the Strong National Museum of Play announced their 12 finalists. Here they are. Bingo. The 1950s... Bingo? Is that Bingo. not in the Hall of Fame? Apparently not. I've never heard of these, but the Briar Horses? No. The little, like, hand-painted horses from the 50s. Oh, um, no. A German game uh, known as Settlers of Catan. Oh, yeah. Never They're heard of it. Oh, no. uh, Light Bright. A making perennial all star. How to uh, uh, making uh, things in line, right? Did yeah. all the magical the sparkling the light. Yeah. Um, what else? Oh, Masters of the Universe, He Man and oh. She Ra, finally. Oh. It is shocking they have not made a He Man movie. They did. Oh, didn't they? They did. I mean, they made their oh, you mean like a the Hemsworth? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. saying with all yeah. the yeah. properties yeah. coming back. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. It's crazy. Um, Nerf toys, just wow. in general. Nerf. <laughs> Uh, what else we got? Oh, the card game Phase 10. Pound Puppies, which you guys might not be I familiar with. Pound I remember Puppies. Fuck, I'm familiar. Mm. Um, Racco, uh, card no. game. The Spirograph. I was a big fan of the Spirograph. Spirograph yeah. is a big deal. Geometric. And finally, the top. Oh, wow. The spinning oh, top please. has never been put in the hall The dreidel the tra- had the, been around the since shake, the it's tur- a dawn of time. That's oh, right. The, the shixie dreidel. So All those right. are your toys, and the winners will be announced on November 10th. Find a picture of that damn car so I can see that beautiful <laughs> eggplant color. Google him right. me nuts. You got to be on the ground during the procession. Um, it had to be... Oh, There's a ton right. of pictures, but they're not on the ground. That's why so I'm trying to huh. bring it home in the museum. Yeah. Right. Look at that. Okay, Beautiful you know what? Man. I see a hint of Bergen. That's not right. <laughs> I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Just kill me. <laughs> Gina, Gina. <laughs> that was the news with Gina Grad. Then they have pics of it in the procession, huh? They Weird. do, but they're like aerial or it's dark. Hmm. What Here's your picture. I was, yeah, let's see. I mean, that has that has a. A yeah. burgundy finish. On the it. rims look great too. Yeah, nice on Jag. Beautiful car. Classy. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I took note. All right, uh, Dominic, the Moriarty, mm. Moriarty, the Devil's Game, exclusively on Audible, and then also there's Moonhaven, streaming on AMC mm. as well. And then you can go to AdamCroll.com for all the live shows because I'm doing live shows everywhere. And uh, Kim Kahana, 92 oh, years yeah. young, uh, his stunt school, Kahana Stunt School, and this book, Kahana, The Untold Story. And thanks, Dominic. Always Great good to see, see you. you. Come guys. back anytime you like. Thank you. Until next time, it's Adam for Dominic and Kim and Gina and Bald saying, Mahalo. Mahalo.